I haven't really touched on this topic yet because I don't want to offend people. I don't want to say anything that will hurt anybody's feelings or anything of that nature. But due to the time that we're in now, I think it's important that we hit this topic and see what the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures say, what the Messiah will do, and what his qualifications are, and just check into these things one by one. This is not a video about why Jesus is not the Messiah, although there may be points in this video that will show that. That will be discussed in another video. But this video is just mainly to show you five or six points to give you all the scriptures that are listed in the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures as I like to call them so that you can see where these references are. And I'll just use a couple examples with each point so that you can see why the Jews do not accept Jesus as the Messiah. Also, what we are waiting for in the one that is listed in the scriptures. There's a very different mentality between Jews and Christians about what the Messiah is and what he'll accomplish. So again, we always use the Hebrew scriptures as our basis of truth, and I'm just going to show you these scriptures point by point, so I encourage you, when I show each point on the screen, just pause it, write down the scriptures, because I am not going to read every single scripture that is listed with each point. I'm going to leave that up to you and just read a couple examples from each point. Before I jump into the points, what I want to say is, first and foremost, is that when the Messiah comes, whoever he may be, we have to understand that Jehovah is the king. He is the real king of this universe, and whoever he sets on that throne, whoever he sets to lead the people, will just simply be adhering to his words. He will just simply be a utensil and a person used to carry out his laws and his words. That's all. If God could use a bush to speak out of, he can use a man to speak out his words at the same time. As Isaiah 33:22 says, Jehovah is our judge, Jehovah is our lawgiver, Jehovah is our king, he will save us. So our faith and our trust is in him alone. He is the king of glory, none else. And I just wanted to make sure that this point was said first and foremost in this video to make sure that all glory and praise goes to him. Point number one. He must be a literal descendant of King David. Psalm chapter 89, verse 34. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. So what God is saying here is, just as you see the moon in the sky as a faithful witness of the times that be, so will his covenant be forever with David and his descendants. I will not discuss this in great detail in this video. I'll discuss it in another video. But the Christian claim is that Jesus is born of a virgin. What they don't understand is that they are taking this reference as there's 17 times in the book of Matthew alone where it uses scriptures out of context to paint an image around Jesus and then place him as the arrow in that scripture. So they will take scriptures such as Isaiah 7, 14, rip it out of context, and then make it fit Jesus. And I'll discuss that in another video. That Isaiah 7, 14 reference about a son is born unto us and Emmanuel, those passages are referring to the children of Isaiah the prophet. And I'll discuss that in another video. But I just bring this point up because if a person is born of a virgin, he is not of the seed of David. It doesn't work that way. The fruit is determined by the seed, not the soil it is planted in. So, if God did use a man and he was born of a virgin, then he would not be of the seed of David. He is not of his lineage. So, I just wanted to make that point, and that is one of the main things that you will hear that is different between Christian ideology and Jewish ideology. Other than the facts that I'm going to point out in this video, that's a big one, because if he's not of the seed of David, if he is not of the tribe of Judah, then he is not the king of Judah and the Messiah that is to come. Number two, he will be the king shown at the time of Israel and Judah's redemption in Israel, and he will unite Ephraim, the northern ten tribes as they're known today, and Judah, the Jews, and they will all be one kingdom, unified, dwelling in peace in the land and safety. Isaiah 11, verse 12, And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. 
Ezekiel 37, 19, Say unto them, Thus saith Jehovah God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick. And they shall be one in mine hand. And say unto them, Thus saith Jehovah God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. So that's exactly what Judah, that is exactly what the Jews are waiting for, is the redemption. We were scattered due to disobedience of God's covenant, and what we are waiting for is at the redemption when these two kingdoms will unite and there will be peace in the land once again. There's a lot of war going on right now, so before this happens, we are waiting for the redemption that will happen after the war, and then there will be safety in the land. And when that happens, we are awaiting the time where everything will be safe and the people will live in the land safely again. Number three, the temple will be restored when he comes in his days. Now, right now as I'm making this video, we are in the Feast of Dedication as Jews celebrate. And what this feast celebrates is the rededication of the temple. So, this feast will run out through January 1st, so it's only fitting that if things were to happen, it would make sense that it would happen during this festival. But that is what the prophecy says, that in his days, God will place his sanctuary in the midst of the people forever. And from that day forward, all the world will know God's name, and he will make sure that all the heathen know his name, and all the world will know who he is. And all the world at that point will worship Jehovah in unison. Ezekiel 37, 25, And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, Jehovah, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. So when we hear the phrase, the tabernacle of God is with men, that is what it's referring to. This is what it's referring to. The tabernacle of God is with men. Because when God places his temple in the midst of us, then he is saying that he is creating a place of dwelling for himself. Not that he dwells in tents, not that he dwells in a building or anything of that nature. And just as David said himself, the temple is not made for man, but for Jehovah. And that's in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1. But when this happens this will bring the presence of God back to the centralized location of Israel. And that's what we're waiting for. But take a look at the next verse on this subject. Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith Jehovah of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. So when you see in the book of Revelation, who shall be able to stand? This is what it's referring to. It's referring to this text in Malachi chapter 3. And even when you see in Christian texts in the Gospels and it says, Pray always that you may be able to stand when the Son of Man comes. This is the text that it's referring to. Number four, he will lead the world in obedience back to God's laws and the centralized location of government for the world in the land of Israel. And I would say that this is something that was promised to us when we took a hold of the covenant. He said, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, I'll make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and all the earth is his. So the whole point of God using Israel is to set up this centralized location of a world government where all the nations will adhere to that centralized location in Israel. It's not that we're going to be dictators or anything like that. It's actually going to be a kingdom of peace, and there's going to be justice in the world again, and there's going to be peace. There's not going to be any more war, anything of that nature. But this is what we've been waiting for, and this is what Israel's purpose was, to lead the world in righteousness, justice, and obedience to God's laws, and recognize that Jehovah is God, and there is none else. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Jehovah's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall say, Come ye, and let us go to the mountain of Jehovah, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem. And this is a very important thing to understand, is that 
Many will understand the Christian concept of the Messiah as one that came to do the law so that you don't have to do them. So this is another big thing that people have to understand is that God says when he raises up the shepherd, he will do the contrary. He will cause everybody to come back to him and obedience to his laws. Take a look. Ezekiel 37, verse 24, And David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They also shall walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children, forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. All right, and number five, he will be a man. He is not God in the flesh. He will be born of human parents. He will even have children of his own, actually, if you read further in Ezekiel chapter 45 and look at uh, verses 22 through the end, you'll see that he has his own children, he has his own family, and he actually ends up bringing sacrifices for his own sins himself. So he is not somebody that is perfect. He will make mistakes. But it also says that I'll show you in this verse coming is that he will fear God. So he is not God himself. He actually fears God. He will fear Yehovah. So the idea in the Christian concept is that Jesus is God in the flesh. The problem with that is, is God says his name is forever Yehovah and that he is not man. So the scriptures will testify against this concept. And in fact, I would even say that Jesus never made that statement, but it is something that is assumed and passed down from generations. But let's take a look at the scriptures here in Isaiah chapter 11. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Jehovah, and shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of Jehovah, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. So you can see here that he obtains qualities that are things that you would look for in someone righteous, and that is... He is humble. He is someone that will fear the God of Israel. He is not the God of Israel himself because that would go against the scriptures that God said that God is not a man. He is not the son of man. That's Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. And he is telling us explicitly uh, multiple times in his laws that when he spoke to us out of Horeb, when he spoke to us out of Mount Sinai, he showed us no form or similitude. So we should be very careful not to worship anything that has form or similitude. That is the basis behind why we do not worship and bow down to idols because God is the creator and not the created. So he will not go against what his own law says. He tells us many times that cursed be the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm. And he was very angry, if you will recall, when the people asked for a fleshly king in the book of Samuel. So we need to always remember that Jehovah, he's the king. It's not the man. He's just somebody that is representing the people, and he is somebody that will just be the mouthpiece of God. Jeremiah 30, verse 21, And their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governors shall proceed from the midst of them, and I will cause them to draw near, and he shall approach unto me. For who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith Jehovah? So you can see here that when the righteous remnant of Israel returns, as I mentioned in another video, this person, he will be someone from that righteous remnant that will return to the land, and he will be brought forth unto the throne of God, and he will be given the instructions of what he needs to do at that time. So he is not God approaching himself. And lastly, I would just say, look at Ezekiel chapter 45, and you will see that he has family, he will have children, and he will even bring sacrifices for his own sins. So he is not somebody perfect. He's going to make mistakes. So I would not say to expect that from him. Nobody is perfect, as Solomon said himself. There is not a just man in the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So it is expected that people will make sins no matter who they are. But you should expect him to be walking in the covenant and obeying the commandments and teaching others to do so. Do expect that. And the last point I want to make is on that same topic is that just as Jesus walked in the covenant as Christians know that Jesus did, so will the king that God will raise up the same way. Matter of fact, Jesus says in Revelation that he that overcometh, he will give him power over the nations. This is what he is referring to secretly. Revelation 2, verse 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the vessels of a potter, they shall be broken as shivers, even as I have received in my father. This idea of breaking the vessels of a potter is spoken of in the prophet of Isaiah. Isaiah says that he will rebuke those that were not following the law. 
Isaiah tells us that he will just adhere to the law just as it says, and all the hail will sweep away the refuge of lies just as the prophet said that would happen, and everybody will come back into the fold of the covenant. So this was our test. This was our test to see if we would hearken unto the laws of God and overcome the lies that Paul had presented and the doctrines. And the person that does this, God says he will raise up and be the shepherd. And this leads us up to the test for the world. God is raising up a shepherd that will do all these things and he will accomplish these things, not by his own power. He's just a vessel. That's all. But what you have to understand is that this was God's plan to see if you were obedient to his laws and you trusted in him or rather you worshiped the man. This is the test. If a man comes and he is a clone of sorts and he walks just as Jesus walked and he tells you to obey the commandments just as Jesus did, although in parables and hidden sentences and dark sayings, will you adhere to that? Will you obey God or will you trust in Jesus as your savior? This is what this day is about. This is what the whole plan was all about. So I hope this was a help. I'm gonna do other videos that will explain each and every one of the supposed fulfillments that Jesus fulfilled in the gospel so we can see how they've taken these things and ripped them out of context and tried to match them up with him to make it look like he was the one. So um, I hope this video doesn't offend. I know it's a hot topic, but I think it's very, very, very important that I discuss these things on this channel so you have this in due season. So thanks again, and I'll see you again on another video. Let there be light.